So hello to everyone here and to the, the people in the ether online on Zoom tonight. And I would like to commence proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we work, learn and live here on the campus, the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Wunurong people. And we recognise the unique place held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. We also acknowledge their enduring cultural practices of caring for country, and we pay respect to elders past, present and future, and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the Academy. Um, I'm Professor Hannah Louie, one of three co-directors of Akahutch, along with Professor Philip Goad and the Dean, Professor Julie Willis up the back. Um, Akahutch, for those of you who may not know, is the Australian Centre for Architectural History and Urban Cultural Heritage. And really the purpose um, of, of my introduction is to welcome Dr. Rosemary Hill, who is the recipient of the Miles Lewis Fellowship, which is generously supported by the Vera Moore Foundation. Um, and Dr. Hill is a writer and historian, and she has published widely on the history of art, architecture and ideas and has a really deep interest in biography and material culture. And Rosemary is a contributing editor to the London Review of Books, um, a fellow of the Society of Antiqu Antiquarians of London, the Royal Society of Literature and, and All Souls College, Oxford, and a trustee of the Fugian Society. She's written numerous books, including God's Architect, Fugion and the Building of Romantic Britain, which won the highly prestigious Wolfson History Prize and the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. Personally, I think it's probably the most memorable historical biography that I've ever read. Um, and um, then her book Stonehenge of 2008 was described as a history of one of Britain's greatest and least understood monuments. And that won the um, Architectural Historians of America Award and will obviously be partly the topic of the oration tonight. While her most recent book is Time's Witness, History in the Age of Romanticism, published in 2021, which I, again, thoroughly recommend to you. And this visit has been a long time in the making because of um, travel restrictions and COVID over 2020 to 2022. So the visiting fellow program was put um, largely on hold. Finally, last year we could resume and we welcome um, Alex Bremner. And then finally, again, we're so pleased to be able to finally host Rosemary Hill. It's certainly been a long time in the making. Um, and just, I just want to give a bit of background to the Miles Lewis Fellowship, and it was established through the generous ongoing support of the Vera Moore Foundation. And the fellowship supports distinguished international scholars in the field of architectural history and industrial archaeology to visit the faculty and deliver a public oration. And the fellowship was established to celebrate the work of um, Professor Miles Lewis, AM, who, for those of you who don't know, and I imagine most of you do, is an emeritus professor of this faculty and an architectural historian specialising in the interaction of technology and culture, the history of vernacular and Australian architecture and building. Um, his research areas uh, include, but not limited to, um, the evolution of building technologies, prefabrication in the 19th century, iron lighthouses, among many other topics, and um, his, one of his books, Architectura, was published internationally in 2009. Um, and just, um, you can also at the moment, I think, still see a few items from Miles's collection of building elements and materials in the ABP library, still at the moment, um, on the ground floor. And these have been digitised in collaboration with the faculty, and you can find links through the Akahutch website if you're interested in that. Um, so I think without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rosemary Hill is going to talk about the lives of Stonehenge, a prehistoric monument in historical time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you, everybody. It was a great surprise and a great honour to be invited to do this lecture. And I've been looking forward to it, as Hannah said, looking forward to it for slightly longer than uh, would have been ideal. Um, but it's a great pleasure, um, and as I say, an honour to be here. So, without more ado, um, here you are, here's Stonehenge. Um, it's the most famous megalithic structure in the world. I'm sure a number of you have seen it, and all of you will recognise it. It stands on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, 
at latitude 51 degrees 11 minutes north, to be precise. But that's only one of the places that you can see Stonehenge. You can, for example, see it at Aroteroa, near Wellington, where the New Zealanders have built what they rather curiously describe as a working model. I'm not sure what it does. <laughs> um, in Santa Fe, in New Mexico, the um, anti-nuclear sculpture Stone Fridge was created by Adam Horowitz in the late 1990s, and it was oriented on the Los Alamos nuclear laboratories. Finally, to the great relief of the local authorities, it has been declared unsafe um, and was dismantled in May 2007. But in Alliance, Nebraska, you can see Carhenge, a monument built by a man called Jim Rinders to commemorate his father. Not quite sure why he felt that was the most appropriate way to do it, but it has been a great success and indeed has its own visitor center. <laughs> And if you don't want to build Stonehenge yourself, there has been since the 1990s Manhattan Hinge, uh, where you just position yourself in the right place um, on Manhattan. So there are many Stonehenges, but it isn't just the physical image of Stonehenge that can be found scattered all over the world. There are many Stonehenges of the mind and the imagination. And I think the reason that those stones have continued to fascinate people for so long is that they satisfy simultaneously two very fundamental human desires, the desire for knowledge and the love of mystery. And at Stonehenge, there is plenty of both. Over the centuries, a huge amount of information has come to light. We know today many more facts about Stonehenge, how it was built, when it was built, than would have seemed possible even a century ago. But at the same time, we have no idea or rather we have many conflicting ideas about why it was built, what it was for, and what it meant. And so it continues to tantalize and often to reflect back to us the ideas we bring to it. For Turner and for the romantic poets, it was a place of psychic terror and menace. For the antiquaries from the 17th century onwards, it was a site for gentlemanly inquiry. And here you can see William Stukeley and some friends discussing it in a gentlemanly manner. Charles Darwin looked at it from quite literally a different angle. This is a drawing from his book, the unlikely bestseller of 1881, The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of the World. It's actually his best-selling book. Um, and it shows how the stones have been partially buried due to the activity of the earthworms. Well, there will be more to be said about Darwin later, there will be a lot to say about the Druids, for whom Stonehenge is a sacred site, and also about archaeologists, who seldom these days go anywhere without a television crew, and who, it must be admitted, are not always on the best of terms with the Druids. <laughs> Stonehenge then looks different to different people, even when they're on the spot. Further away, the stones can be felt more obliquely. They are there in the abstract sculpture of Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore, in the poems of William Blake, and they can even be found, if you know what you're looking for, at Piccadilly Circus, and I'll come back to that point. So what I'm going to do this evening with you is to consider some of the aspects from which Stonehenge can be viewed. Um, and I'm also going to ask you to keep in mind a broader, or perhaps a, I should say a deeper theme, the question of what happens to the prehistoric monument when it encounters history. And what I mean by that is the way in which its nature, its physical nature and its cultural significance are modified by better, for better or for worse, when it becomes part of that Western classical intellectual tradition of which we are all part, which is what we call history, a chronological documentary account of the past. It's very different from that general, and all humans have a sense of the past. They may think of it in terms of their ancestors, they may have it written or only partly written, and they may have a sense of the past which lives in a culture as a continuous present, what those of us who inhabit the world of history are inclined to call myth. And the birth of history sometimes means the death of myth, but not always. More often, I suggest there is a kind of fusion which changes both, and sometimes there's a kind of friction. So that's the underlying theme 
architecture. And I would ask you, who have a much older prehistory around you all the time than we have in Britain, to keep it in mind so that we can come back to it perhaps at the end um, if we have time for a discussion. First, however, I'm going to take us on an appropriately circular tour of Stonehenge, looking at it from various directions as it has appeared to architects, to artists, to scientists, to casual visitors over the centuries. What I'm not going to do is tell you what Stonehenge was for, because I don't know and I don't believe anybody else does either. Um, I'm going to begin and end the circle with archaeology. Um, it's from archaeology that we've gained most of those facts that we do have, though it must be said that the archaeologists are very divided among themselves, and there is almost nothing in this little resume that I'm going to give you that one of them wouldn't dispute. Stonehenge itself was built over a period of a thousand years, and it went, broadly speaking, in three phases. Archaeologists always like to divide things into three phases. Um, one of the first secure dates that we have is for the beginning. Work started in about 3000 BC with the digging of a large circular ditch. But the site was already an ancient one. It was surrounded by long barrows like the one you can see at the bottom there, which were already a thousand years old and going out of use. And it was another thousand years before anything like what we think of as Stonehenge, that famous outline, um, emerged. Before that, there was simply an earthwork with some sort of timber structure, which varied over time. Then came the stones, the large sarsen stones, which were found locally, and the blue stones, which are the little ones in among, which came from the Priscelli Mountains in Wales. And so the thing that we call Stonehenge began to take shape. Uh, although there is evidence that the blue stones had been somewhere else and they'd been assembled in different forms. There seems to have been nothing quite like it in megalithic architecture, either before or since, and its construction, which must have been very laborious, was based on timber construction. And that's in a way the most important thing to understand about why Stonehenge looks like it does, that it is essentially a timber construction imitated in stone. As such, and like all experimental architecture, it had its difficulties. Um, there's some reason to think that the first stones fell down already in the prehistoric period. <laughs> Another thing we don't know about Stonehenge, though it's often assumed that we do, is whether it was ever actually finished, whether it ever formed a complete circle of the sort that is imitated at Arosha Roa. Um, we do know that it was used as a cremation, a site for cremation uh, burials, and probably given the fact that it's a relatively small number of burials there, it would have been for a selection of particularly important people. The last things that were added to the um, site were the Y and Z holes, which you can just about see in the middle there. And we know nobody has any idea what those were for. They were dug in about 1600 BC and never apparently used for anything. They were the last addition but by no means the last alteration. Because the monument as we see it today dates not entirely, strictly speaking, from 1600 BC, more like 1964 AD, um, which was the last time that the stones were moved. All but seven of the uprights and two of the lintels have been repaired. They, while they were doing this, um, they knocked another one of them over. And pushed it um, there's a wonderful cutting from the Salisbury local paper called Heave Ho Stonehenge. People were much more um, gung ho about that sort of thing in those days. Um, so all but seven of the uprights and two of the lintels have been repaired. And most of them are now set in 20th century concrete. Um, and we shall come back to the 20th century in due course. Meanwhile, however, back in the early Bronze Age, Stonehenge began to lose whatever its function and its meaning for contemporaries had been, as it began to recede out of living memory. Prehistory turned into history, and nothing, or nothing that we know of, happened to Stonehenge. But with the coming of the Middle Ages, a view of the British past began to be formed, and it included Stonehenge. The first written account was in the history of the kings of Britain, Historia Regum Britanniae, by Geoffrey of Monmouth, published, well not published, 
produced in the 1130s. Um, and this first explanation of Stonehenge was immediately followed by the first row. And it must be said that the history of Stonehenge is basically a history of huge rows. Um, Jeffrey's idea was that it had been brought from Ireland by Merlin and assembled, as you see here, on Salisbury Plain. Um, and Jeff, when challenged, um, as he immediately was by critical readers, um, he claimed, Jeffrey claimed that he'd got all this information from a friend called Walter the Archdeacon, who had it in a book, but neither the book nor the Archdeacon ever turned up. Um, and by 1190, people were complaining of Geoffrey of Monmouth, everything this man wrote was made up. But in fact, <clears throat> the stories were too good to lose because Geoffrey's history of the kings of Britain includes the first accounts of the Arthurian legends, the first version of King Lear, um, and they attached a narrative to Stonehenge that it was never ever to shake off. And so with Geoffrey, Stonehenge was launched into history, into mythology, and into controversy, and it's been there ever since. The Scala Mundi, which is an early 14th century history of the world, includes this slightly more plausible view of Stonehenge, but as you see, it has been made rectangular to conform to the demands of the scribe's grid. And that's really what's happened ever since people have been fitting it in to a pre-existing idea. Well, in time, with the coming of the Renaissance, history began to take shape as a discipline, and it was essentially a literary discipline. It relied on written sources that be, could be consulted. And in 1534, when Polydor Virgil published his Anglia Historia, Walter the Archdeacon and his book had still not turned up, and there were no other documentary sources. Virgil said that the monkish chronicler uh, was guilty of most impudent lying, and he booted him and Stonehenge out of the halls of history. And so Stonehenge passed into the hands of another kind of inquirer, the antiquary. Antiquaries were, antiquaries are, as, as Hannah said, I'm a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, people who study the material remains of the past, which includes um, manuscripts and documents, but any other kind of material remains as well. Antiquaries were the first archeologists, the first architectural historians, the first oral historians, the first local historians, the first people, in fact, to interest themselves in much of what we think of today as history. And many of them formulated theories about Stonehenge. Um, and we'll be pleased to hear, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I am going to touch on two of the most influential, one of the most plausible and one of the least plausible. But accuracy and impact are not the same thing in historical studies, and both were hugely influential, and so they're equally important to the historic life of Stonehenge. The shocking one was Eilat <laughs> Sams. Eilat Sams's book, Britannia Antiqua Illustrata, appeared in 1676, <coughs> and it got the worst reviews since Geoffrey of Monmouth. Um, Sams was described by his contemporaries as a pedantical coxcomb, his book was described as ignorant and silly. It made all sorts of extraordinary claims about the past. It suggested that Stonehenge had been built by the Phoenicians, that it was a temple to Ogmius, that Ogmius was also the Greek Hercules who had once come to Britain. It was a farrago of misinformation, despite which it has attached itself forever to the story of Stonehenge. Why, you might wonder, well, it was the pictures that did it. <laughs> um, especially this one, The Wicker Man. And this image, which derives very loosely from Caesar's description of the Druids making human sacrifices by tying prisoners to a wicker figure <coughs> and setting fire to it, was so powerful that it went into the cultural bloodstream. It crops up again in Wordsworth. It comes again in the writings and the illustrations of Blake and, of course, the cult film of 1973. But the antiquarian hero of Stonehenge studies is um, William Stukeley. Stukeley, whose book Stonehenge came out in 1740, had trained as a doctor. He was a friend of Isaac Newton. It was to Stukeley that Newton told the story of the apple falling and giving him the idea about the theory of gravity. And Stukeley spent years <clears throat> investigating the stones in a completely empirical way measuring them, drawing them, trying to understand them in their own terms, not as something magical or mythical. 
And in that way, he was very modern. It was Dukely who coined the word trilithon, meaning three stones from the Greek for the great door-like compositions. It was Dukely who noticed that the site was aligned with the summer and winter solstices. And he found by careful observation, the avenue that leads from Stonehenge to the river. And a feature that was lost then for hundreds of years and has only relatively recently been um, rediscovered. But perhaps Dukeley's greatest contribution to the understanding of Stonehenge was his realization that the circle was only part of a great connected landscape full of ritual and symbolic meaning. And he saw it as everybody sees it in the light of the preoccupations of his own day. And he was living just at that moment when landscape gardening was becoming an art. And so he and his readers were sensitive to this broader idea of Salisbury Plain. Um, he knew uh, Richard Cold Hall, who was building the great landscape garden near Stonehenge at Storehead. And so, as I say, this idea of landscape architecture really was just dawning, and that was what he could see beyond Stonehenge. Stukeley's book on Stonehenge put it on the tourist map. People began to come and visit it as a site and it is still useful to archaeologists today. But what the archaeologists, of course, don't like about Stukeley, and what indeed they find very difficult to forgive, is his introduction of the Druids to Stonehenge, um, who've been a permanent fixture there since 1740. <laughs> very little is known about the historic Druids, the priests of the ancient Britons. There are those scraps of information in Caesar and in Tacitus, but those accounts are very slight, and we now know that they were written thousands of years after Stonehenge was built. Stukeley didn't know that. The 18th century did not have such a long view of history. Um, it was very difficult to calculate how old the earth was. Newton had expanded space, but time was still constricted to what you could work out from the Bible. It was generally believed that the world was about five and a half thousand years old. And Archbishop Usher, working for biblical <coughs> sources, calculated that creation took place on October the 22nd, 4004 BC, which was a Saturday. Um, so it wasn't perhaps entirely odd that Stukeley thought Stonehenge was built by the Druids. What was very odd indeed was the way that he bulked out these early sources with immensely elaborate accounts of Druid habits and rituals. And he gave them a pagan proto-Christian religion you can see a kind of crucifixion or sacrifice going on down there. Druid robes, worshipping in oak groves, all of this comes from Stukeley's elaboration. And it has given later generations much to think about, much to extrapolate from and to argue about. And as I say, it has infuriated academic archaeologists. <laughs> When the antiquaries looked at Stonehenge, they were looking for facts, however unlikely, but other people looked for other things. Architects have long been fascinated <clears> by Stonehenge <throat> because whatever it is, and if you're going to talk about what disciplines it belonged to, um, certainly doesn't belong um, necessarily to archeology, span but whatever else it is or isn't, it is certainly architecture. That is, it is a building aesthetically conceived it has ideas of symmetry, proportion, inside and outside. The architectural historian John Summerson called it the soul of architecture laid bare. And the first whole book to be written about Stonehenge was by the great architect of the Stuart dynasty, Inigo Jones. His Stonehenge appeared posthumously in 1655 and was another terrible flop. Um, the history of publishing books on Stonehenge doesn't necessarily go very well. Jones thought that Stonehenge was built by the Romans um, and had originally been hexagonal. In fact, in his version, it came out looking remarkably like a piece of Jacobean architecture. But for all that he was obviously wrong about what Stonehenge had been in the past, his ideas were immensely important because they brought it physically into the present and they sent it on into the future. What Jones was doing at Stonehenge was looking for an origin myth for his own profession. He was the architect James I, but his title was surveyor. 
And in Italy, where Jones had been traveling, he had encountered the Renaissance, the ideas of the Renaissance, and the value that it accorded to the figure of the architect as a true Renaissance man. Perfect in design, expert in geometry, well seen in the optics, skillful in arithmetic, a good historian, a diligent hearer of philosophers, well experienced in physic, music, law, and astrology. And Stonehenge, uh, Jones's Stonehenge was a kind of a manifesto. It was an attempt to elevate his profession in Britain to this um, height to associate it with a classical authority, a classical past. So he decided that Stonehenge was an example of the Tuscan order and that this was the first Ur architecture. Well, in one sense, obviously not true and certainly very difficult to prove, but what he did with it was to build it into the architecture of London. This is Covent Garden where Jones built the first ever piazza. Again, so he'd been traveling in Italy, he'd seen these great open squares. Most of London was still wiggly streets with overhanging um, timber houses. Here he created the wide open piazza for the Duke of Bedford. And at the back, the church, St. Paul's, is built with a great portico in the Tuscan order. This order that he has found at Stonehenge, which gives authority and classical precedent um, for his own work as an architect. It was one of the most innovative pieces of town planning in Europe, and it derived directly from a theory about Stonehenge, as oddly enough, did the next great innovation in British street design, which was the work of another architect with the Stonehenge fixation, John Wood. John Wood, um, for whom not such good pictures survive, I'm afraid, um, <laughs> but he was responsible for George and Bath. Wood was a Druid man. He didn't believe that Stonehenge was the work of the Romans, and he had an even more elaborate view of the Druidical <clears throat> past than Stukely. He knew Stukely, and needless to say, they quarreled terribly um, and disagreed. Wood believed that the Druids, who Caesar said never wrote anything down, he believed that he had encoded, they had encoded their beliefs in their buildings. Wood believed that Bath had been the seat of the ancient and fairly mythical king, Bladad, that it had been the center of a complex of Druid civilization, and that the stones at the nearby stone circle of Stanton Drew were a Druid university, and that Stonehenge itself was a temple to the moon and the sun. So far, so odd. Um, it might not have gone any further, but Wood and his son were the architects who developed Bath into that famous Georgian city that though Nash so loved and Jane Austen so disliked. And here, the King's Circus, begun in 1754, Wood created a wholly new building scheme. It was, there hadn't been a circus before, a circle of houses. It's a circle of 60 houses, um, to reflect, and it's exactly the same size as the circle at Stonehenge. There are 108 acorns, you can see them on the top, uh, to signify the Druidic, um, tendency to worship according to Stukely in, um, in oak groves. After Wood's death, his son continued on and built the Royal Crescent, which again, and he built that in the Ionic order to symbolize the Crescent Moon. And again, the Crescent was a new building form. Um, and you can see from above how um, extraordinarily um, detailed it is and how extraordinarily clear and what I find interesting and in a way moving about Wood is that he started off with a theory that I think it's not unfair to describe as completely bonkers. And he made it come true from the belief that the ancient city of Bath was a symbolic city in which the Druid faith was encoded in the very fabric. By the time he finished with it, that was true. It's true to this day. Um, and that was not his only legacy, because, as I say, he invented the idea of the circus. So all circuses, Piccadilly Circus, St George's and the rest, all take their lead from Bath, all owe something to, the sto to Stonehenge, all the way down to the humble traffic roundabout. Um, and so does that great modern city, famous in Britain, at least probably not so much here, for its roundabouts 
Milton Keynes. <laughs> Milton Keynes um, was being planned in the 1970s based on the ideas of the Californian um, sociologist, Melvin Weber. And this was the age of Aquarius and the architects looked back once again to Stonehenge. They were thinking about ley lines and psychedelia. The architects were young. They were, by their own account, often quite stoned. And they came up with some very far out ideas, like this one by Andrew Mahadi, who kindly lent it to me, to lay out the whole town on the lines of sacred geometry. Um, in the end, more conventional wisdom prevailed. But the center of Milton Keynes is laid out in boulevards called Silbury, which relates to Silbury Hill, <coughs> another prehistoric earthwork near Stonehenge, Avebury, which is another stone circle, and Midsummer. And Midsummer, which is the main boulevard through what you can almost call the center of, Sto of um, Milton Keynes, um, is so aligned, virtually <coughs> on an aerial view. Um, if you are in Milton Keynes at dawn on Midsummer Day, you will see the sun rise through the shopping center and hitting a branch of John Lewis. <laughs> um, so, after the antiquaries and the architects, we move, we move on to the romantics. And so we're sort of coming <coughs> to the, the furthest point in our circular trip away from the archeologists. Artists and poets don't really mind about the facts at all. Both Turner and Constable moved the stones around on paper. Their Stonehenge was a place of mystery and psychic terror, and it was also political. Against the background of the French Revolution, civil unrest at home, a fear that the whole structure of society might collapse into chaos. The stones seem to represent an awful warning. Um, the Romantic Stonehenge was a place of um, mystery and psychic terror in Blake. It echoes the guillotine. Um, no romantic poet is ever going to write um, a poem called A Fine Day at Stonehenge. Um, and it was now at the height of the Romantic movement that the Druids began to escape from the pages of Stukely's book and to seep through like Wood's mythic King Bladard into real life. It was a period when myth and history were very close, when people particularly in the aftermath of the French Revolution, the Revolutionary Wars, wanted to get away from history to some extent. They wanted to return to the idea of myth. It was a huge vogue for the supposedly ancient poems of Ossian, which turned out not to be quite so ancient on closer inspection, but they were hugely influential. And the poems of Thomas Gray and others fed this romantic appetite for a prehistoric mythic past, away from the rather frightening facts, and also away from the past of Greece and Rome. It was, um, it was to be a native, a national British past. And this is uh, John Martin, the painter John Martin's version of Gray's Bard, who is about to leap into the gulf, um, a desperate act of suicide, rather than be taken by the Romans. And in 1781, in a pub in Soho, the Druids finally manifested um, when a man called Henry Hull founded the ancient order of Druids. Um, this is the pub, it still survives. I had my book launch there. Um, and the ancient order of Druids has had some very distinguished members over the years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have to tell you, those beards are stuck on, um, and it has been, it has rather sort of tended to undermine people's admiration for the Druids when they see the very obviously stuck on beards. Um, the Queen was, the late Queen was also a member of the Ancient Order of Druids until she was expelled, um, which is very typical Druidic behaviour. Um, <laughs> so the point at which um, history and myth have come together, here you have 1815, um, the Grand Conventional Festival of the Britons, and it comes from a history of costume. Now, there's very little actual history in here. Uh, this is all really, one might say, made up. Um, you've got Stukely's own interpretation at the bottom, where he sees the pattern of Stonehenge um, and Avebury uh, with the Druidic serpent weaving through it. 
And so from this extreme point of romanticism and myth, we begin to encounter the dawn of a more sober age as we start to return back to the starting point, the archeological view. It was in the 19th century that archeology span itself was born. The Victorians were much less in awe of Stonehenge than their predecessors. They thought it was interesting. They thought it was a nice spot for a picnic and they visited it in unprecedented numbers. But they felt fairly confident that its mystery, such as it was, would soon be unraveled. This was the age of empire, and the steam engine, photography, as you see, and of geology. And it was the geologists in the end who broke through Archbishop Usher's time barrier this is Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology. And they showed how the earth had changed slowly over eons of deep time, opening up huge vistas of prehistory. And it became apparent that the world was older and mankind's history within it was longer than anyone had imagined. And so the stone, bronze and iron ages were born, more three phase things. Um, and as explorers and colonizers brought back ever more information about South America and about India, people realized that there was megalithic architecture and indeed stone circles all over the world. It must be said, of course, that some of this Victorian confidence was misplaced. There were now even more theories about what Stonehenge was and who'd built it. Romans, Buddhists, tribes from Gaul, none of them were provable, and some of them were laughable. Also, the Druids by now were thoroughly uh, ensconced in people's mind. People liked them, they wanted them. And if we go back again to Darwin's view, you can see that he refers to the Druidic stones. Um, and that would have annoyed his geologist friends, including Lyle, because they were beginning to realize that the Iron Age Druids couldn't possibly have built Stonehenge. The chronology was coming, was separating out further and further. The other great question that Stonehenge posed to the Victorians was the question of ownership. It had stood on private land since the Reformation, and it now belonged to the local landowner, Sir Edmund Antrobus, who did his best to protect it. But the railways brought more and more visitors. Many of them came with hammers to chip bits off it. And indeed, if you forgot your hammer, you could buy one when you got that from the stall and the damage was becoming a serious problem. It should not be left to chance in a single person, as Charles Dickens put it, to safeguard the future of such an important national monument. And so it was at Stonehenge that was born the idea, something we now take for granted, this idea of state ownership, what we have come to call heritage. Stonehenge was always the test case for this, and it was a long and bitter fight. John Ruskin, who more or less invented the idea of heritage, as well as Dickens, supported the campaign for a National Monuments Preservation Bill. It was given a first reading in 1873 and it failed. And it was read again and failed again every year for six years. It was felt by Disraeli's government to be an infringement on property rights, always very dear to the hearts of the Englishman. Eventually, the bill was passed um, and Punch, as you see, had great fun wondering what a publicly owned Stonehenge might be like. Um, the first inspector of ancient monuments was duly appointed. He was General Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, and at Stonehenge he met his Waterloo in the shape of Sir Edmund Antropus, because Sir Edmund not only refused to sell the monument, he joined the Druids. <laughs> <laughs> The Victorians had learned more about Stonehenge than any previous age. They had managed to place it in geological rather than biblical time. They would measured it more accurately. They'd photographed it. They compared it with monuments all over the world. But they left it more damaged and more vulnerable than ever before. And on the last night of the 19th century, December the 31st, 1900, with a terrible crash, Stone 22 in the Sarsen Circle fell. And so the 20th century dawned. In 1916, as a result of the death of the heir and then Sir Edmund himself, the Andrebus estate was broken up and the stones and the triangle of land immediately around them were put up for sale as a separate lot. They were bought at a local auction uh, for £6,600 on impulse by a man called Chubb, who it was said wanted it as a present for his wife. 
Two years later, Chubb did the decent thing in exchange for a knighthood, he gave it to the nation. And so in 1918, Stonehenge was finally public property. And that, of course, was when the real trouble started. The 20th century was the best and the worst of times for Stonehenge. It was excavated for the first time. The archaeologists had been itching to get in and dig. Antropus had kept them back, but now they, were, they got in. And the excavations brought vastly greater understanding. It became clear, as I explained at the beginning, that the monument was built in phases. Archaeologists also worked out how the stones had been raised with ramps. And they came up with more and more theories about um, why. But as William Stukeley, as I explained, he'd been a doctor and he applied the technique of vertical dissection, which he had used in medicine. He applied it to archaeology. But as he pointed out, the trouble with that is that dissection destroys its own evidence. And the digs in the early 20th century, according to the archaeologist Christopher Chippendale, destroyed about half of Stonehenge by stripping away the surface. But the question that dominated and divided the century was the question of ownership, because which you might think had been settled. But it's all very well to say that something belongs to the public, that the public is a hydra headed entity, which was embodied at Stonehenge in the Ministry of Works. And pretty soon there was a degree of dissatisfaction with the way that the ministry ran Stonehenge. And here you can see the architect Clough Williams Ellis complaining already in 1928, about all the ugly clutter spoiling the site. The battle for ownership was fought at two levels, intellectual and physical. Intellectually, people began to get very irritated with the official archaeological line. Um, the archaeologists were keen on the facts. Painters and sculptors at the same time were coming back to the stones in a way that they hadn't looked at them since the Romantic artists. It was Henry Moore who came and saw Stonehenge by moonlight, and that gave him his whole vision, really, of what landscape sculpture could be like. But, as John Piper complained, we refer to its atmosphere of worship at our own risk, on the same terms that we leave our car in the car park. And matters came to a head in 1960s, when archaeology, which that explains a fairly new discipline, was suddenly challenged by a much older uh, academic discipline, astronomy. Gerald Hawkins' Stonehenge Decoded appeared three years before the first moon landings, so at the height of the space race, and it caused a sensation <clears throat> by suggesting that the builders of Stonehenge had been sophisticated astronomers. And this infuriated the archaeological establishment, and so yet another huge row broke out. And at this moment, the academic consensus broke down. There was a great gap, if you like, in the official understanding of Stonehenge. Everyone who disliked the Ministry of Works approach, the artists and the mystics and the hippies and the UFO watchers and the skeptics, and of course the Druids, the Druids have been periodically storming Stonehenge at the solstice all this time, um, were allowed back in. And they came back as writers, they came back as artists, and they came in person. And by the 1970s, the Stonehenge Free Festival was underway, marking solstice. And so Stonehenge underwent yet another of its periodic transformations and became an icon of the counterculture. For their 1983 album, Born Again, the band Black Sabbath, I'm not sure how well known they are here. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, they arranged to go on tour with um, a set based on Stonehenge. And unfortunately, presumably they hadn't seen it. They specified that they wanted it life size. Mm -hmm. And they ended up with a set that filled three containers and was too big for any stage. Um, Anyone who's seen Spinal Tap will know this um, the version. Um, the, other thing that happens there. <clears throat> the next crisis in the Battle of Stonehenge came in 1985 when a newly created body, English Heritage, decided to clamp down on the Free Festival. Um, it was a calculated and there'd been no trouble at the Stonehenge Festival, but it was decided that it should be stopped. And the police clashed with festival goers as they made their way through the fields in what became known as the Battle of the Beanfield, where it was widely felt that the police had used unnecessary force. Um, 
the Earl of Cardigan, who was the head of the local conservative association, who was sent along to observe, gave evidence against the police at the magistrate's court, much to the surprise of his fellow conservatives. Um, and after that moment, the solstice at Stonehenge became an incredible grim farce with the imposition of a four mile exclusion zone, which was patrolled by dogs and helicopters. People um, who lived in Amesbury nearby, the nearest village, had to show identity documents to get into their own houses. And so, once again, Stonehenge changed. Now it became a focus for civil liberties protesters um, led by Mr. Um, John Rothwell, a motorbike messenger, as he started off, who changed his name by deed poll to King Arthur. <laughs> so Geoffrey of Monmouth's idea lives on. So Arthur and his loyal Arthurian war band posed repeated challenges to the exclusion zone, getting themselves arrested in ever more imaginative ways. <laughs> um, until in 1999, I mean, Stonehenge has been a test case for so much, the whole argument for, for heritage. Now it became a test case in the House of Lords, the Supreme Court, for a ruling on the Criminal Justice Act, which supported King Arthur and the public's right of access at the solstice. And so English heritage was obliged to offer managed open access, which is what it does now very successfully. Um, there's never been any trouble since they opened it up to the, at the solstice. And it's a very English kind of event. That's, um, I don't know when that was, I took that off the internet. Um, and that on the right is the winter, I took that as the winter solstice of um, 2010. Um, and here's some more of the, um, the 2010 winter solstice with King Arthur, you see on the right, doing hand fastings, which are very popular, pagan wedding services. And then on that occasion, at the end, this huge snowball fight broke out. Um, <laughs> so that's been very successful. Less successful have been the attempts to manage the traffic. Um, the roads, because as I said, it was that triangle of land that was sold off from the Antrobus estate. And the roads that Clough Williams Ellis thought were spoiling the view in 1928 turned into the A303 and the A344, and Stonehenge was caught between them physically and also trapped metaphorically between the competing interests of conservationists, archaeologists, road planners, and particularly intransigent, the army who um, used Stonehenge for practicing. Um, there have been some good developments on the positive side, the A344, which used to go right by the heelstone, has been grassed over. Um, and after much debate, delay, and so on, there was a new visitor centre designed by your own, very own Denta Corporal Marshall. Um, we still think of it as the new visitor centre, but it is now 10 years old. And um, there are plans to do something with it. I'm not quite sure what the beginning of this yet. The future of the A303 continues to provoke emotions on the scale from outraged incredulity. The most recent proposal, which is to put the whole road in a tunnel, was approved by the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps, but the decision was appealed. Um, King Arthur and the Loyal Arthurian War Band of course, were very opposed. Um, and in July 2021, the High Court explained to the Minister that what he was proposing was illegal. Um, and the current official position when I left England is that there is no time scale for the Stonehenge redetermination process. The current official position, um, and you can look up, as I said, there's no progress at all. And those who are interested in theories of nominative determinism may be interested to know that the current project director for National Highways is a man called Derek Parody. <laughs> <laughs> this cartoon, um, is, if anything, more relevant now than when it was published 15 years ago. Um, and we, too, are nearly at the end of our tour. And rather than leave you on such a gloomy note, I would refer you to one of the more happy circularities. Geoffrey of Monmouth, whose book got such terrible reviews, was the first to suggest that the blue stones were brought from Wales because of their healing properties. And so the site was some kind of healing shrine or hospital. In 2006, the Guardian newspaper ran the headline, Stonehenge was a hospital. 
And this was the thesis behind the dig in 2008, um, led by Wainwright and Darwin, and that's Geoffrey Wainwright, late with Geoffrey Wainwright on the right. Um, and the interesting thing about this photograph is that at the end of the, ceremony, of the dig, there was actually a closing ceremony, which is why he's standing with that person with the horns. Um, so there was an attempt to placate this more mythical and religious view of the site. The solstice continues to be a very happy occasion. English heritage now says, I mean, since they first started to open it up, it's gone from being, you're only allowed for a certain time and you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that. It's now much more celebratory and it does acknowledge the fact that the stones are sacred to many people, albeit in a rather vague way. Um, the last invasion was in 2020, <coughs> when the Druids, in true form, broke the English heritage COVID restrictions by entering the circle at the solstice. Um, but that would quite quite really. Um, and so in the end, what we have left is the stones themselves, which never fail to impress, because whatever else happens to them, their beauty and their strangeness <coughs> abide. Thank you. I think we have a bit of time for questions, um, either from online or in the room. We'll start with in the room, Theo. But thank you so much for, I think, that terrific journey through um, this long and circular history <laughs> and, and how myth and fact become what we call history. I think it's really terrific. Any questions? Jane. Why is there this um, total liberty of interpretation with ancient monuments like this, the prehistory? And you get it not only with this one, but with others. Why do you think it is? Because there's no writing. As soon as you get writing, um, I mean, the interpretation. Why is there such liberty of interpretation with a monument like this and other early prehistory monuments? Mm -hmm. May I just request that for the benefit of people watching at a distance, that you repeat the question into the microphone <coughs> for the sure, sure. Yep. and that the speak, both of you speak closer to the microphone. Fair, that isn't actually a microphone, but we will speak up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, for the recording. For the recording. Oh, for the recording. Oh, right. Sorry, yes. sorry. Yes, you're right. Um, liberties of prehistory. Any other? Well, the, yes. I mean, the question was, why is it that um, prehistoric art monuments are so much more open to interpretation. And I think that the fact is writing, because if you look at, by comparison, say Egyptology, um, you have a lot of records, written records to go on when you only have the artifacts. And I say that's why Stonehenge, the his, well, when history got going, Polydor Virgil got going, he said, well, you know, what can you say about it? Um, Defoe says the same thing when he was looking around Britain at prehistoric monuments. He said, well, what you can say is, there it is. <laughs> um, a simplistic never stop most people, but it is, if there's nothing to read. Uh -huh. um, the 1966 publication uh, and the measurements that were made, have they been um, questioned or are they now considered uh, authority in terms of it, it being a sort of uh, astronomical timepiece? Well, um, no argument is ever finally settled, but the, um, <laughs> the, quest the question was whether the astronomical alignments have um, been accepted. Um, the archaeologists, as I say, were absolutely livid about this and so um, commissioned another astronomer to um, check the measurements with and commissioned an article which was intended to say, this is all hooey and nonsense. Um, but unfortunately for them, he said, no, it's pretty much right. <laughs> um, so um, that was very embarrassing for them. And there is, what, to the extent to which it may or may not relate to lunar eclipses, is still very much debated. Um, but that there is no, I mean, why wouldn't people be able to, um, and, and the, um, Alexander Tom did a lot more work on ley lines and so sites, lines, sight lines between prehistoric monuments. You know, these people knew that the, they didn't write, but they were highly intelligent and they understood 
their landscape and they understood the sky. So I don't think it's been it's been argued over like everything else, but the basic question I think was the basic idea was established. Established. Yeah. Karen, um, could you say something about Stonehenge in relation to ideals of national identity? Um, I get, did you hear that? But could I say anything about Stonehenge in relation to ideals of national identity? Um, I'm often asked about that, and I think it's quite curious that it has never been a symbol, really, of Britain. James the First, James the Sixth and First, King of Scotland, who then inherited the English throne. There are certain kind of symbolic allusions to it in the ceiling of the banqueting hall at Whitehall, um, because it does, you know, suggest an idea of Britain. But it's never been that. Oddly enough, it is, you know, as I say, in Blake, it's very menacing. Um, it's been all the kind of hoo-ha with um, the Druids, with King Arthur. It's very often been taken up at a countercultural, not an anti-British, anti-patriotic, but a very countercultural, <coughs> contrarian side. So, no, it's never come to be um, a national symbol at all. It is surprising, but it hasn't. And has there been any rethinking of its history as, as knowledge of other similar sites around the world in terms of their, their prehistorical sites? And I think I heard there was an exhibition that was an exchange between Japan and Stonehenge. And so has that started to impact as well, I guess, knowledge? Um, well, our archaeologists are always talking to each other and Gowland, who did the only really, really responsible 20th, 20th century dig at Stonehenge had worked in Japan. There were, for a long time, links between Japanese and British archaeologists. Um, so, I mean, people realised that putting up stones in circles or in rows was a thing that lots of people did. But there is nothing like that. And my own personal theory is that, as I say, it's a, it's a wooden construction imitated in stone. And I think when they've done it for a bit, they thought, this really isn't working. I mean, it's incredibly <laughs> laborious. And so nobody ever tried anything so um, laborious and arguably foolish again. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was very much an experimental building and there's still not anything quite like it. It's been found. Um, were, the stones, oh, yeah. were the stones originally in the natural shape or rotted shape that we see now? or they're more finely dressed, or what evidence is there? They're, um, they're very finely worked. Um, <coughs> and you can see in the museum, they found that among the things they found were these chalk balls, which you have in a sling, and you just whack, whack, whack. So the, um, the outside is, uh, the inside is more finely worked than the outside. Yes, they've been eroded. Yes, stones have been taken away. Farmers have used them for building. Um, they've fallen over from time to time, as I said. Um, so anybody who, you can go in the shop, you can buy, especially for children, pop-up Stonehenge, which shows you what it looked like originally. Nobody knows what it looked like originally. It's, it's very nice, but it's not necessary. It's not provable. Well, on a less ambitious scale than Hannah's question, surely you have to interpret it now in relation to Darrington walls, the wood hinges, and to the Scottish monuments, which they now claim were part of a culture that linked to a Stonehenge. Um, surely the understanding of it now must relate to all of that context. Oh, yes. I mean, I think for a long time, the, uh, it's been quite clear that all the way up the coast, um, from Brittany, up the west coast, through um, the Hebrides, um, at Kalanish, um, and on up to Orkney, these were clearly people who were in communication with each other. The work at Durrington Walls, which is another um, circular monument where um, Darwin and Wainwright were working um, and others, has, I mean, that's definitely an inhabited site. Um, there's lots of evidence of people eating there and people living there. There are, again, you know, there is an interpretation which I've included in my book, which suggests that it, the people who built Stonehenge and possibly what we would call worshipped at Stonehenge, lived at Durrington Walls. That's perfectly possible, it, but if you can't prove it, or at least nothing has so far emerged that would prove it. And also so far the work that has started on towards the first tunnel has destroyed some of the evidence from Durrington Walls. 
So we go on basically from one huge row to another. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I'm an archaeologist, but I, I just wanted to make a comment about so the I... role of Stonehenge. Apologies. <laughs> the, the, the role of Stonehenge, um, I'll just start a row, I thought, um, <clears throat> within uh, heritage management. So my, one of my first jobs out of, of university was as a custodian at Stonehenge. Wow. So I was working in the gift shop and I was working as <laughs> a kid's kids when it was still the underpass, you know. Yeah, of course, yes, the horrible entry, underpass. Whatever it is. Yeah. And um, the, other, the, the most fun part was actually standing around on the path and stopping yeah. druids going in and recharging their crystals and people scattering their ashes at their, their dearly departed uh, yeah, yeah. stones. It was a really interesting job. Um, <laughs> but at, at the time, I learned that um, the proportion of the income that English heritage derives from Stonehenge is remarkable. Mm. Like it's something like thirty percent of English heritage's income. As I as I learned at the time, I, you probably have better statistics than I do. But as a result, the almost the standing of this this place within the the, the framework of English heritage management is is really significant. It um, is from a financial point of view. Huge. Um, and, and as a result, it's sort of I wonder how much bearing that's had on. On the way that the managers have seen its its management uh, to direct enormous. I mean, the thing is also since I don't know when you were working there, but in the last six, five, six years, English heritage was split in half. Mm. And historic England, historic England, yeah. and yeah. English heritage. Very confusing for everybody. Mm. But um, so his, um, English heritage, which which is now the custodian of um, all the monuments. That have belonged to the state, including Stonehenge, um, was set up as an independent charity. It was given 80 million pounds and told it had five years to become financially viable. <laughs> and as you can imagine, it's been a huge challenge because I would, I don't know, but I would imagine that Stonehenge now accounts for more like 50% of their income because a lot of what they've got, which is incredibly important, is you know Roman foundations and bits of wall and mm -hmm. things that uh, are very important, but people don't pay to go and see them. You can't have a gift shop, you can't, the yeah. druids aren't interested. Um, so um, yes, I mean, it, it's incredibly difficult for them. And, and that's why the whole business with the tunnel, um, or not the tunnel, what to do with the visitor center now it's 10 years old. It's really fraught because if, if English heritage isn't financially self-sustaining within the next 18 months, it is very unclear what will happen. Yeah. So, yeah, it was always interesting, the itineraries, people, tourists coming in for the one or two days, you know, the Americans flying from, yeah. to, to London, and they've got think, three days to do England, Stonehenge, <laughs> Bath, <laughs> London. To well, one of the things <laughs> that was really annoying, when because the previous visitor centre was, I mean, it was just, Ghastly. It was a terrible underpass under the road. And it was described by all the tour companies as a toilet stop. So it was just Stonehenge was a toilet stop on the Bath to London tourist route. <laughs> um, so you can see why English Heritage got slightly desperate. But of course, trying to get and the land around it because of the way that it was sold off. So land around it belongs to the National Trust, mm. which holds its land in, the in perpetuity. And so anything English Heritage wants to do, they have to get English Heritage, they have to get the National Trust to agree with. And oddly enough, King <coughs> Arthur has at various moments, I mean, he does kind of drive people nuts, but he has at various points been quite helpful in um, mediating um, between <laughs> English Heritage and the National Trust. And uh, they had very good um, talks in the <coughs> 2010s. Arthur insisted on having a round table, of course. Um, two more questions. What's the evidence uh, for the wooden tree structure? I mean, have they found wood? Um, there, well, so there's the, the, the two things. The pre structure, yes, they found post holes, particularly when they were, I mean, this is the thing the archaeology and destroying its own evidence. It, whenever there's a terrible intervention and people like me are going, oh my God, oh my God, um, as they dig down, of course, they find stuff. And when they built the car park in the 1960s, they found um, the post holes. And it's not clear what the wooden structures were, but over time, it has become established that there were, at various times, wooden structures. This 
structure in stone. As I say, you can see it's a post and lintel construction. And indeed on one of the cross stones, you can see where they started to um, hollow out from <clears throat> the, the dip. And somebody's come along and said, no, it's in the wrong place. And they flipped it and done it on the other side. So there are, there's evidence of mistakes and there's very clear evidence of it being a post and mental construction, but the wooden, what exactly the wooden structures were, we don't know. Thank you. Um, fascinating talk. I wonder whether you've got any comments on Thomas Hardy's um, use of Stonehenge in Tess of the yes. Hills, because that would have been written at the time of the controversy about making it a public monument. Yes, I mean, Hardy, one of the things I really dreaded about writing this book was having to reread Tessa for <laughs> one of the most horrifying, but it, but it is, I mean, Hardy was not so much in his use of Stonehenge, those of you who haven't read it, um, Tess, um, well, she's hanged in the end, but her, the kind of, she's taken by the police at Stonehenge. Um, but it was really, Hardy believed, and very much as a result of the things I've been talking about with with Darwin and Lyle, that human consciousness had evolved beyond the stage where we could really cope with the pain of human <coughs> existence. Um, and so that was his take on prehistory and evolution. And that's why I think he brings Tess to Stonehenge at the end. Terrible. Sorry. No, it's awful. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Thank Very you. Haughty. Well, join in thanking Rosemary. It was really terrific lecture. And I suppose putting you on the spot, one of your, your itinerary is to drive to Uluru. Yes. So we might have another. I think it does give us pause for thought about our own national histories and, uh, and how we might rethink them in this, in this way. I think it's inspiring. Um, join me in thanking Rosemary very much.